Welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I'm your host, Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Most of us, not all of us, but most of us, came into this world because of sex. Isn't it a bit strange that the very act that is an essential part of our very existence has become the focus of taboos, shame, addiction, anxiety, compulsion, obsessions. My guest today is going to help us figure this all out. Welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii, Dr. Janet Brito. Thank you. So it's about time that we got a good sex therapist here. There aren't too many. What did you say? What? There's two licensed sex therapists yeah, in, in Hawaii in right Hanul now? In, in Honolulu. Honolulu. Wow. So you just doubled it. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. So. I know one does not just hang up a shingle that says sex therapist. I think mm -hmm. people would be curious, you know, what kind of training did you have to go through? To yeah, so my first degree is in social work, and that's uh -huh. my first love, and I have a master's in social work, uh -huh. and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And then in 2011, I went to the University of Michigan. They have a certificate in sexual health and education. Uh -huh. And I did that um, for a year and a half. And so I have a certificate from them um, in human sexuality. Uh -huh. And in 2008, I, I went to get my PhD in clinical psychology and completed it at uh, my postdoc at the University of Minnesota. And that was a fellowship that focused on human sexuality. And it's one of the few in the nation and internationally. So the past two years, I really um, did most of my special specialized training at the University of Minnesota. So is there a typical client that calls you up? What are the, the people that call you and say, mm -hmm. I need help? Mm -hmm. Is there a commonality about what they're asking for help with? Yeah, most are calling and they're they're really anxious when they're calling mm. um, most of them are calling for help about their relationship uh, most are suffering from perf performance anxiety or they're uh -huh. feeling really worried about whether they're um, satisfying their partner or are they doing it correctly uh, this could range from either premature ejaculation or mm -hmm. delayed ejaculation to women with painful sex or uh -huh. um, low sex low sexual desire uh -huh. um, and then there's other people that call with out-of-control sexual behavior, which is known in the media as sex addiction. Uh -huh. And this is when uh, individuals are having a hard time controlling the urges. Uh -huh. um, so some people may use shopping or eating or um, going online. And some uh -huh. people use sex um, as a way of coping. Um, uh -huh. and that could be with excessive porn or masturbation or affairs. Wow. Um, and then I'm working with people with um, dealing with gender, so um, help with social or medical transition, so uh -huh. help with uh, transgender health. Um, and I've ha I have some couples, same-sex couples, just um, LGBTQIA affirmative care. <laughs> I know it's getting like an alphabet soup, so working yeah. with um, just providing a safe space for people that are dealing with um, their sexual orientation or sexual identity was a lot of different things. Yeah. I, I noticed that you, each time you talk about it, you um, differentiate, you, you make a difference between what you're calling out of control sex mm -hmm. and addiction. Mm -hmm. Why do you do that? There's a, it's very controversial and it's debatable. I was trained with a more out of control sexual behavior model or uh -huh. compulsive sexual behavior. There, there are debates on what to call this. Uh -huh. um, I call it that because uh, the way that I work with that uh, problem is through a behavioral approach. Uh -huh. So I believe that um, once we can identify the pattern of what's happening before, during, and after, we usually call that a cycle, um, it can be better uh, controlled versus uh, somebody who is dealing with an addiction is m coming more from a 12-step model or uh -huh. a chemical addiction model and I don't see it in that way. Um, I know this is very debatable, and uh -huh. if somebody is coming with me and they're working the 12-step program, that's fine, I'll work with them with that. Right. Um, the only um, disagreement I have about that is that it's very abstinence-based, and I, uh -huh. I find that difficult to manage because sex is an energy and it's part of our life, and right. I, don't necessarily. And I would assume most people don't want to have no sex anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's difficult, right? It's like 
just let's cut this off out of your life and you can't masturbate or you can't, you know, and so that, for some people, they need that. And right. therefore, but it doesn't work for all. So I think uh -huh. it, I, the way that I approach it is more a behavioral approach. That's so. very heartening for me to hear, especially because even with drugs and alcohol, uh, which is the more common addictions that you, there are a lot of people that are turned off by the 12-step model, mm -hmm. either because they have trouble with the higher power part mm -hmm. or by, you know, thinking, defining themselves as um, having an illness, mm -hmm. right? Right. So it has more of that kind of pathologizing, more right. shame-based, and I don't see it in that way. I think yeah. it's something that can got out of control and now it's really affecting your personal life and your relationship and let's explore this in a more accepting way to see so you can start to feel better. So um, I do this show because I'm selfish. I do everything for me. <laughs> I'm a narcissist, <laughs> but maybe. But what I'm thinking is that I work, a lot of my practice is with couples. Mm -hmm. Couples come to me mm -hmm. and among those clients, there's a decent percentage where there's been either an infidelity hmm. uh, that's either real or perceived. Hmm. And even if it's just perceived, that's real too, mm -hmm. right? And then 95% of the time these days, somebody sees something on somebody else's phone mm -hmm. and they go, oh, so look at all these text messages. They come in and they show me, look at these text messages. Mm -hmm. Look, look, hi, handsome, hi, beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then perhaps the person who's been doing that, whether it's the man or the woman, will feel like, yeah, this is something that I, I seem to be out of control with. Mm. Like mm. there's a whole series of people he or she has been texting, mm. been sending sex messages, mm. right? I mean, mm. it's gone all the way into their, our government, right? People have got lost their governorships mm -hmm. or whatever because mm -hmm. of that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you don't do a 12-step model and somebody is saying, yeah, it, it is out of control. I mean, I guess that's the first step. Mm -hmm. It's like the client has got to feel like it's a problem for them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or else they wouldn't be showing up unless right. they're or being dragged in said, by their partner, right? right? <laughs> Fix him. Right, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So what do you do when they, when they come in and they say, yeah, I, yeah I've, I've got 27 hundred names of women on my phone. Yeah, so I usually start off with an initial assessment and it's a very um, rich uh, sex history. So really asking a lot about, uh, obtaining a background information, which includes an extensive sex history. So uh -huh. I'm asking about, um, for them to tell me about their first sexual experience to uh -huh. what is their current situation now to what types of messages have you received about sex. And this is a snapshot, the first session, and then yeah. we can continue it on for the next you know, two to four sessions uh -huh. on really understanding what's happening. And then I really ask them to let me know about what was the last time, let's say the last time you text this person. Let's talk about that moment. I wanna know what's happening to you before you're sending out this text, what's happening to you during and after. Uh -huh. So identifying the thoughts as detailed as possible, the, the feelings, and the body sensations. So what's happening in your body? And most couples, most people are not aware of what's happening, either with feelings or body or thoughts. So this is like, whoa, this is a this is Yeah, a that's new. I would say, oh, my finger is pushing the button. That's what's happening. Right. So it's like, OK, let's pause for a moment. This is not to be judgmental. This is just to really understand and explore what's happening with you. And if we get that, we're trying to develop the, identify the pattern. What is the pattern? Because there is a pattern. It's like I tend to do this when I'm anxious, when I'm bored, ah, when I'm So lonely. you're also looking at what happened just before. Right. That's the main thing is trying to identify what's happening. What's before. the trigger? What's the trigger? Exactly. And that could be people, places, persons, things, feelings. Feelings. You know, feelings. Yeah. And those it's are usually get ignored. Because um, uh -huh. it's hard. Some people don't know what their feelings are. So. I, I try to encourage them to use their body as a way of signaling to them, like, what's happening? Okay, I'm having maybe a little rapid heart rate or I'm, you know, having a headache. So let's pause. What, how are you feeling at this moment? Oh, wow. I, I'm really glad that you said that because when you say that you have a behaviorist approach, the classical cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't look at feelings so much. Right, right. So I, so I was trained with predominantly CBT right. at University of Minnesota, and I'm very grateful for that training. Yeah. 
but I went to Pacifica Graduate Institute, and that is a predominantly psychodynamic ah, orientation. That's why. And then I went, you know, my social work degree is more of a systems approach. So I, I consider myself more of an integrative therapist, and I incorporate all these things, like the body. I really believe in a more holistic approach, like yoga is essential. You're, uh -huh. You know, those CAM modalities, complementary alternative medicine, like those are essential too. So like, let's, let's fit it all in, and I try to get as much, incorporate a lot of those tools that I've learned throughout the years with, with the client. Do you also go back with your psychodynamic training? Do you go back to family of origin stuff? Yeah. So yeah. part of the steps initially is with stabilizing the mental health so oftentimes there's depression or anxiety mm. may or may not medication might be useful uh -huh. um, and then once we have that stabilized or chemical use getting, uh -huh. that, getting that stabilized identifying the pattern what are your triggers what are you doing now to for positive coping once you have like that foundation then we're going to go into exploring your family of origin because you have some tools now it's going to be it might be triggering going back to that time so mm -hmm. we're not going to go into that right away if you're not able to regulate right now so yeah the other thing that i'm thinking of um i often find that there's some history of sexual abuse that happened mm -hmm. in childhood mm -hmm. that's a lot more common than I think most people realize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's probably, a, a, you know, there's a lot of shame around that, mm -hmm. so it's hard to get to that, mm -hmm. for people to remember that yeah. or, or to acknowledge it or say it out loud. Right. Right. And, but that must also influence what's going on with them in their relationship sexually. Absolutely, because the body remembers. I mean, I think that, you know, so the body, I think, develops these coping skills to survive. And then some, what happens in when you're in relationship, you might not be in that threatening environment, but your body hasn't learned a new way of mm. uh, relating with your partner. So it just takes its time in relearning, relearning uh, things. So I, I like that. You said the body remembers. Yeah. So it's almost like a PTSD thing. I, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's somebody wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a really popular book. Yeah, yeah. talking yeah. about how everything that happens to you is stored in your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. so when a couple comes to you mm -hmm. and there's mitch, mismatching desire, mm -hmm. how do you work with that? Somebody, one partner wants sex all the time and the other one seldom right it's very distressing for them for the individual and for the couple and how do we create a space where we can be on the same page and so part of that again is the, starting off with the sex history and getting information from uh -huh. from the individuals and then um really challenging the couple well first i asked the couple what is their goal so how are you one person wants to have sex seven times a week and the person wants to have it once a year right. so it's like okay how do we renegotiate this this yeah. is you know we're, we're not kind of balanced here and so yeah. first is kind of getting them to some type of agreement and maybe they agree to once every two weeks okay, okay that's that's reasonable okay and so how are we going to get there and the number one thing is which they don't like to hear is about scheduling scheduling sex and mm -hmm. so the way you schedule your work, your hair appointments, your mm -hmm. children's activities, mm -hmm. you know, this is also needs to be on your schedule. This is going to be a time for you to connect with your partner. And it may not start off with intercourse, um, mm -hmm. if this is a heterosexual couple. Uh -huh. It may start off with just building the base. And so one technique is called sensate focus exercises. I don't uh -huh. know if you've heard of that. Yes, but talk okay. more about it. So it's really um, taking the inner course out of the table initially. Uh -huh. and this is for a heterosexual couple. So they're developing, we're trying to encourage more of a sensuality, pleasure-based approach uh -huh. and taking away the performance goal orientated. Right, because like, a lot of times there's a lot of anxiety around performance. Exactly. And then that and people get frustrated and that's maybe that maybe that's why they've been avoiding it because they don't feel they're good enough at doing it or they can't either party. Either party. Right. So it's like okay, forget about this. So this really kind of is a gradual introduction to some couples haven't touched in a while. So yeah. yeah. It yeah, so it's about 15 15 minutes each. I'm like it's it, you can do this about sharing um, sensual massage. So uh -huh. clothes there's no uh -huh. genital touching in, uh -huh. in the beginning and really reconnecting with your partner so you're really identifying what is it like for you to touch your partner and then for the partner receiving it's like what is it like to be touched in this way from my partner 
And so then they talk about it, like, oh, that was really nice. You haven't touched me in that way in a while, or this is really awkward, right? And then. Do you ever, I mean, I have to ask this. Um, do you ever do that in session? Will you ask them to hold hands or a any kind of touching at all with a couple if you're working with um, a couple? I'm not against that, but no, uh -huh. I haven't. I, no, I have not done that. I mean, I, I observe how the couple interact uh -huh. in session as far as proximity and physical touch. Right, right. You know, are they comforting each other physically? Um, but I, ha I, not at, no. It's too scary for couples, you think? Um, well, couples are afraid. They usually ask me, are we going to do anything physical in these yeah. sessions? And I usually say, no, it's not. You're going to be doing this at home uh -huh. when you're comfortable in the privacy of your own space. And then we'll report back in session. And what do so. you say when they say scheduling sex? That sounds so unromantic. Oh, yeah, it's so boring. <laughs> I know it does sound boring, but you're a modern family and uh, or else this is not going to happen. You right. know, and so. If we're trying to shift, then this is something. That, unless, what is your idea? How do you want to go about it? <laughs> you know, you have a different idea. Than right. What they've been doing one. so far, obviously, is not working. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'm like, let's 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 give this a try. And yeah. so, I, I know, what I say and what I find in my personal life is that scheduling sex is great because I have something to look forward to. Yeah. Right. I, I guess if my partner is not so looking forward to my, maybe, you know, she's got something to dread. <laughs> I hope not. Right. <laughs> Which can happen, right? Yeah. You know. It's like, oh, no, we have to have sex tonight. Right. <laughs> and then I think the whole week also plays a role into the What happens day. during the week. Exactly. Let's get back to that because we have to take a sure. break and we're going to build things up. Don't go away. <laughs> I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I'm Stephen Philip Katz, and I'm still with my guest, Dr. Janet Brito. And thanks for staying with us because we're now going to talk about the buildup, right. setting the scene during the week. Right. So we have a sex appointment Saturday night. <laughs> right. So how do we get through to Saturday night? What should happen? So one, one important thing that could help is identifying each other's love language. So uh, have you heard of that? Yeah, that yeah. book. The, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's helpful. It's good information. So if my love language is acts of service, that uh -huh. means I like, you know, my partner putting gas in my car or, uh -huh. you know, making me lunch. Or, That's love to you. Right. So it makes your lunch. Exactly. Right. So and the other person likes uh, words of affirmation. So I love throughout, you, darling. Exactly. So <laughs> You're throughout so beautiful the week, tonight. I love your hair. You exactly. look great. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this throughout yeah. the week. On Monday, I'm acknowledging that and saying, you know, you look great today. That shirt uh -huh. looks fabulous on you. Thank you. Right? And I'm, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm making your lunch. You know, you're, you're, do, you're building the stage. I'm helping with, with the children if you, have, if you have kids. Right. So you're doing these intentional um, uh, behaviors and uh, actions to uh -huh. really show your partner that, you know, you're interested in you, and you care. You care about this. So that's why often you hear, look, you can't just come to me at 8 o'clock on Saturday and expect to have sex, right? Well, like when you don't talk to me all week. Right, right. If there's some old resentment uh -huh. or I'm, you've been mean to me or you haven't been available or you've been out of the house all week working, it's, it's difficult. There's no, I call it like, let's build some bridges. And right. every couple has different ones that they feel good about. So it's really That's identifying. That's the love languages thing. Right. right. And then, so what is it? It's yeah. uh, affirmation? 
Uh, words of affirmation, quality time, quality. physical touch, acts of service, and uh, gifts. Gifts, right, gifts. stuff. Right. Right. I'll buy you a new dress. Right. right. You know, <laughs> so that could be one way of like, oh, hey, maybe I can do a little bit of that. And, and so when, when I think what couples have a problem with is they think, you know, that, that what is that? The golden rule is really backwards. Not do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Because if I'm a guy that likes gifts and you're a person that likes acts of service, it doesn't work to get you a gift. Right, right, right. <laughs> Even though I would like that done for me, I have to understand that you would rather me make your lunch. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and that, is, that, that could be a bridge versus like a poison, right? It's like, oh, uh -huh. I'm doing this that I know you don't like this. So it's, it's really kind of damaging. Right, because I mean, it's, people get stuck. They say, yeah, but this is what I like to do. Right. You know, well, it's not about you, buddy. <laughs> right, it's about listening to what your partner is asking for. Yeah. And I think that goes a long, long way in, into the bedroom. Ah, all that, those bridges during the week. Yes, right. absolutely. And then once you're there on your date, it's really, you don't, it's uninterrupted time. I mean, you, you, the kids ah. are at the babysitter or they have somebody, they're busy or they're sleeping or whatever. You're really creating a space, you know, right. music, lighting, really seducing your erotic self. Like, okay, ah. you know, creating seducing that. Seducing your erotic self. Yes. So and you're seducing yourself. Yourself <laughs> and, your, and, and your, your partner. And your partner. Right? But you, everybody's individual, it, different about what is seducing to them. So it's really having these conversations. Like, I, you know, some persons might like this light, dim lighting, you know, and some people mm. might like, they want all the lights on. I mean, so really Some it's, people might, might want to do it in the elevator on the way to their may, office. Maybe. <laughs> you know, so it's figuring out what, what that is for you. Uh -huh. And so having this, you know, half an hour, doesn't have to be a lot, uh -huh. where the phone's going to be off, nobody's going to be interrupting you, and you're really able to be intentional and focused and pay attention to each other. That's hard for people. It's really difficult, especially if there's a, a lot of hurts that have uh -huh. not been... So sometimes resolved. it could take a long time. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's not only hurts, but it's awkwardness. They don't know what to do. Right. So. Um, and sometimes I prescribe people to take each other on dates. And there's such fear of performance anxiety on just doing that. Uh, right. Like, you know, I'm going to take you to a dinner and I'm afraid she's not going to like the restaurant I've picked out. Right, because right. maybe there's a lot of criticism, right? In that, ah, in that you've been listening, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like, well, you criticized me before, so I'm afraid to take these these steps again because right. of these past things. And as as hard as it is to say, just let it go, it, it still sometimes simmers and So do you on. find that with some individuals you have to be very prescriptive because, you know, you're working with me and let's say I'm, I'm clueless. Like, I, I don't... I don't know what to do, like to build these bridges during the week. Can you actually like write down? So, Steve, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, I mean, like during the assessment, I'm getting uh, a lot of information about what is your experience about having relationships, maintaining them. You know, have you had a history of doing this? What has it been like growing up with your family on how love is expressed? So I can get information about... <laughs> they express their love by screaming at each other. Right? So it's like, okay, this is all you've known, and now you're, it, this is what you're doing. So sometimes people just are unaware. And so learning new, new ideas may, uh, and me helping them or giving them suggestions could be what's necessary for them. It's ticklish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's interesting. So I asked you before during the break about meditation. Can meditation help couples with this part of their lives too? I, I believe so. There has been some studies on using mindfulness-based approaches uh -huh. with women with low sexual desire and women with a history of sexual abuse. Um, and the research comes out of uh, Canada, Dr. Mm. Lori Brado, and I actually did one of... Um, it was a mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy approach. It was a group therapy, set, uh, uh -huh. psychoeducational nature uh -huh. group, and it was really helpful. The only thing is that it, it's time consuming, so if you don't have the time or energy, because um, it's 45 minutes of um, guided meditation uh -huh. per, per day, uh -huh. because you're really having to retrain your body and re learn to relax. 
So some people don't have that time or energy to commit to that. Uh, and I, that's okay. I think uh -huh. that 10 minutes, even 10 minutes a day right. is okay right. because, you know, we're so busy and the, the busier you are, the more time you need for a quiet time to really reset and relax your body. And sex is all about relaxing because if you can't relax, then it's going to be really difficult to right. experience pleasure in that way. So I really believe in mindfulness and um, people can start off with apps or um, YouTube. They have body scans on YouTube or I like Headspace. It's a uh -huh. digital app and uh, it's a guided meditation. It totally tells me what to do. Take a, it's take free? A, yeah, it's free. Take wow. a breath now. And so it really, it really helps, you know. Uh -huh. So I do think that's an important um, skill to integrate. Um, yeah, and I, I ask couples sometimes to do it together. Like, um, uh -huh. would you both be willing to do this together? I meditate before we go to bed each night with my wife. Oh, good. Yeah, that's it's great. great. Yeah, yeah. we'll do 20 minutes. It's, in, it, it's helpful, right? Yeah. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. Right. Yeah. And then I just read this. Uh, there's this woman, a performance artist. Her last name is Abramovic. She did this thing at the museum where people would come up and they would just stare at each other. Oh. for up to an hour oh. mm -hmm. and they were talking about all of the emotion that would come up mm -hmm. and I noticed that in couples that I work with sometimes they can't even look at each other mm -hmm. at all never right. mind for an hour right <laughs> right but I would you know try that sometime with somebody that you trust you mm -hmm. know don't go up to a stranger <laughs> right <laughs> and just just no talking no touching just eye contact mm -hmm. I mean you're allowed to blink but not too much yeah and, and emotion easy. comes up we right. started giggling like crazy when we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. oh, he's telling me we got to wrap it up. It feels like we just started. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. And uh, is there anything else that you'd like to sneak in there before we cut off? Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh. I'm really happy to talk about sex therapy in Hawaii, and it's great to be home. And Call Dr. Yeah. Janet Brito. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. And thanks for joining us once again for Shrink Wrap Hawaii. See you next time. Aloha.